We are citizens and servants. Now, the Holy Spirit, through Peter, is speaking to the believers, and he uses this word that in our culture today is most offensive, almost the most offensive word. It's a word that is very hard for us to say and even harder for us to do. It's right up there next to forgiveness. It's called submit. Our culture does not believe in submission, except for the one who wants people to submit to them. But it's not something we run to as a society, right? Submission is a very foreign word. Let's look what he says in verse 13 through 20. Submit, to your, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as, a bond, as bond slaves of, Christ, of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants. Be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer, suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Now, in 2 Peter, the next book Peter writes, in chapter 3, Peter acknowledges that some of the things that Paul writes are hard to understand. Okay? The interesting thing is, this week, what Peter writes is not hard to understand. There's no confusion. Right? It, it's, it's not hard to understand, but it can be hard and difficult to carry out. Right? That's why he's writing to us. Uh, in verses 11 and 12, Peter spoke about believers as pilgrims. They're not, this isn't our home. This is a temporary residency, right? I think that's the, we're alien residents. This isn't where we're staying. This is a passing through thing. That was your first relationship. In verses 13 and 17, he talks of us as citizens, right? That's, we're citizens of a country, a state, a county, a city. And then in 18 through 20, he addresses more of a social or domestic aspect of a servant. That's kind of the picture. But we're in all three of those roles. Um, and as we look at these verses today, there's two things I want you to remember. One is to try and be mindful of what Lee talked about last week, about the warnings and the instructions in verses 9 through 12, about the call to holy living, okay? and not license. Because if you give yourself over to your fleshly lusts, I believe that this is going to lead to dishonorable conduct, which he talked about. But eventually it will manifest itself in rebellion both to civil and domestic authority. Why? If you're sinning, you're doing what you want to do. You're not listening to God. You're not listening to the authority. Ultimately, you're establishing yourself. Oh, that's what he told her in Genesis, right? The day you do this, you'll be like God. Right? That, that idea, I want to be God. That's our nature. And secondly, consider how that when someone refuses to submit to authority, uh, they are asserting they are above that authority. Okay? And they're superior to the authority, and this includes God. You know, in that vein, now think about this. Uh, perspective of authority. I got to give you a story. Um, I met a guy. I used to work with a guy. I was. Um, I did the computer systems for him, and uh, Jeff was his name. I'll give you. Jeff was in a Marine in Vietnam, and he told me, "I achieved my lifetime goal in Vietnam." And I, I'll never forget this. Says, "What was your lifetime goal, Joe? Joe uh, Jeff? Big guy. My biceps were bigger than my neck. My neck was 19 inches." So Jeff and I. 
We had a camaraderie. Yeah. He was a big Marine. I was a little Marine, right? But we worked with a guy, Brian. He wrestled in the 90-pound class. He was the, my manager. And one day we were just having a conversation about things, and our, our, our demonstrative spirits kind of came out, Jeff especially. And Brian is laughing, and he sees this big guy, and he says, how could you, you know, think about the Marines. He goes, how could you take orders? And, and Jeff just hit it. He goes, you take orders because you give orders. And see, the perspective here is when you're not submitting to authority, then where and how do you think that those who are around you will submit to authority that you have, be that in the home, the workplace, the church, or if you're in that position of authority? So submission is global, and it applies to us in every aspect of our life, and that's what Paul, I'm sorry, Peter, is going to talk about. Now, before I go deeper into 1 Peter, I want to take you over to, Paul says, some parallel passage in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. This is what Paul says, and he covers the same ground, but he adds some uh, slightly, uh, some slight, significantly important other things to what Peter has said. So we're building upon the whole counsel of God here. Romans 13, every person is to be in, be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Verse 3, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to be fear from authority? You want to have no, no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same. For it is the minister of God, it is the minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is the minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers, rulers are servants of God, devoting them, themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due to them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Did you notice what... Paul added, he stated that all governing authority is established by God and that there is no authority but what is established by God. Daniel addressed this when he talked to the king. He said, it is he who removes and establishes kings. That's in Daniel 2. In Daniel 4, the response is that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. He, God, bestows on whomever he wants to. So he's establishing in Daniel, Paul repeats it, Peter speaks of it, that the authority we're talking about is established of God. Okay? Now that's count, contrary to our culture. Our culture thinks they've got it all figured out, they're the ones doing it, and they're wrong. Now, here's some things you can pick up from what Paul said. God has granted civil authority the responsibility and the right to punish evildoers to the point of including capital punishment. If you look in verse 4, they don't wield the sword to direct traffic. It's lethal. A sword was used for lethal action. It was to kill. That's the picture. If you kill, government has authority and responsibility in that area. Also, as much as we may despise taxes, <laughs> Paul says God ordained government the authority to impose and collect taxes, and therefore as Christians we are to what? As Matthew 22, 21, whose, whose image is on that coin? Caesar. And he goes, well, then render to Caesar the things of Caesar, and to God the things that are God. And why do I bring that up? Because I will tell you there's a whole lot of Christians who say, well, this doesn't apply, and they have their own twist on it, because I don't want to pay my taxes. You know what that's called? Rebellious greed. Right? Now, let's go into 1 Peter um, 2, 13 and 14. 
Submit yourselves to the Lord for the Lord's sake to every human instrument, institution, whether to the king as one in authority or to the governor sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Now, submit yourself is, is a, it's a military term, is where it comes from. It's to arrange in a military fashion under the commander. And, and the one picture I got in my mind of this, and if you were in the service, I, if I say it, I, I'm sure that in your mind you know what it is. It was the simple command, fall in. Okay? And if you've ever seen, the, the, you know, if you ever want to see a really fun video, look up the, the young recruits showing up at uh, one of the Marine Corps recruit depots at about three in the morning after being up for about 36 hours on purpose. They drag them out to keep them up and they get off and the first thing they tell them is to fall in and they have these little yellow feet painted on the, on, on the ground so they know what it means. And that's where they begin to teach submitting to authority. But, but the idea of submitting is that idea of that military order under a commander. And I, I remember when we were in, uh, you know, we'd get out there in the company or the battalion and a guy go out in the middle of a big parade deck and one guy he'd yell it and you'd have a squad you know squads platoons companies all show up in a very military fashion everything was everybody was in spot on time it was the way it worked that's the picture that it's a, it's following instructions doing what you're told ultimately submission submitting is a decision of your will now, as you may know, the military has some pretty strong-handed ways of getting you to get to that decision. But ultimately, to submit or not to submit to rebel is a decision of your will. Is it not? You make a decision. I am going to or I am not going to. And what Peter is saying is, you're going to. He's getting you to the point where you say, well, that's what it is. That's what I do. And trust me, there. And if you ever were in the military and know somebody in the military, there were things that they had to do that they didn't really want to do. But that's what you did, because that's where you're at, right? The picture. Now, all people, including believers, uh, they may be pilgrims in the world, uh, as stated in Romans 13. By God's design, we are all under civil law and authority. That's just what it is. That's by God's design. Remember the Garden of Eden? Before the fall and everything was contaminated and all the sin? You know, God started out with, first off, it's not good for man to be alone. And he gave Adam Eve. And from there, the earth populated. Right? And as it populated and grew, before the flood, there was no civil authority. Men did what was right in their own eyes. Their wickedness grew. Grew to the point that God said, I'm going to destroy man from the earth. That's what happens when man says, I'm on my own. I have no civil order. No civil authority. Wickedness will grow. It flooded the earth. And so God flooded the earth to rid it of that, that, um, that sinfulness, right? God was compelled because of our own rebellion. That's what's in us. The idea of rebellion against civil authority arises out of the evil heart of man. God hasn't put us on the earth to be this lone wolf. But we want to be. Our human nature is, I don't want somebody to tell me what to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you don't believe that, look at that little infant in the crib. He isn't interested in what mama wants, is it? I don't care it's three in the morning. I'm wanting something to eat. And he's going to make sure everybody in the house knows it, right? That's how they work. In Jeremiah 17, 9, your heart, my heart, the heart of all men is inherently deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Yet God tells us what? To live humbly, submissively to this world and to civil authority. Which is godless, hostile to God and one another, self-serving and self-promoting. That's another fact, even some more, that we should do, uh, be obedient to Hebrews 10, where he tells us not to forsake the gathering together. As we come together, that brings us out of that. It's kind of like a refreshment from the world. That's the idea, the objective. Now, the, so there's no confusion or dissent or discussion to whom or to when Paul or Peter is speaking. He makes it very clear. Every institution, you submit to the king or the president or his governors, his designates, right? Those who are appointed by him. 
Oh, and where do you see that most clearly today? Where do you see it most clearly day to day in your lives and my life is in the police? You know, the police are an extension of the authority. I, 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 um, when my son was in high school and he was doing some math classes, he wanted a very special calculator, which was kind of at the time very state of the art. And so I got it for him. And when it came on, it looked like a, um, one of those video games. And he had an instructor who saw it and assumed that he was playing video games. So what he did was he took it from Nathan and corrected Nathan in front of everybody, to which Nathan um, responded. And it became kind of a contention. Well, so Nathan got himself uh, you know, down to the office, and uh, you're getting Saturday detention. And you know, he was very upset because the teacher was wrong. This wasn't a game, it was a calculator. And I told him, I said, you're absolutely right. And I said, had you kept your mouth shut, had you done what he told you to do, when you went to that office, and when you called me, you would have had an ally. And I, as your father, would have fought that battle, and you would not be doing detention. But you're gonna do detention because of this right here. That teacher is an extension of the authority of the school. You're to submit to them. Let the ones over them dictate rightness. That's not your job. Submit to it. It may not be right, but I'm here. I'm here as your father, and trust me, we would have had a conversation with the principal and the instructor, and I says, I bet you I'd have gotten that instructor to apologize to you in front of the class, just as he insulted you in front of the class. But the fact was, he didn't. So he got to spend Saturday picking up trash at the high school. But that's okay. It was good for him. A couple, a couple years later, he was at the Marine Corps and he found out the teacher was nothing. Um, <laughs> that's the best life. Okay, now here's the key part. Mark this down. If you have a note in your Bible and you want to make a note, there are no exceptions, no provisions from agency or form. It's the president, it's the governor, it's the king, it's government. Civil authority is civil authority. Because the ruler, as Paul, Peter, as Paul said, the ruler has a responsibility to God to whom they will answer. Now that's gonna be a reoccurring theme in the background throughout this. Understand that there are people who are gonna to have to respond or answer for their actions. You and I as, as servants, as citizens and as pilgrims to God. And those who are in charge will have to answer for their actions, right? So you're thinking civil government is evil, it's unjust, and it's unfair. They're only looking out for themselves, for their little cronies, and anybody else inside the beltway, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. God knows it too. Now, there, there is an exception. So I know you all been wanting to know what's the exception. Well, here's your exception. When the civil authorities tell you explicitly to do or not do what God has explicitly said for you not to do or to do. That is your exception. And he is, is black and white. Don't, get, don't try to get fuzzy on it because you will pay the consequences. Proverbs 24, you'll pay it. I'll give you two examples. Acts 4 and Acts 5 where John and, and Peter are called before the rulers for doing what? preaching Christ. And they told him, don't ever do this again. Don't ever do this again. He says, when they summoned him, they commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be to the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And then they keep going, they get released, and they keep doing it again so they get drugged back up before them. And in chapter 5, he says, they, they, they challenge them and they say, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jesus, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, intend to bring this man's blood on us. Boy, they're, you think they're feeling guilty there? They were guilty. Verse 29, but Peter and, and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That's a very narrow window, okay, of where you get to um, 
go in not submitting to the civil authorities. There are not a lot. I already read to you, Paul and Jesus both said you pay your taxes. Um, and if you notice that Peter and John, when they defended themselves before the council, when they answered them, they still did it with respect, okay? They didn't curse at them. They didn't call them names. They just gave them fact answers. They did it with respect and honor, honor to the position that they were in. The verse 15 says, For this is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. This is that question, why, right? You know, okay, submit. But why and how come? Well, it's real simple. It's direct. It's the will of God. That's <laughs> what he says, right? It's the will of God. It's for the Lord's sake. That's why you submit. Um, when you resist, when you reject, when you rebel authority, you are doing it to God. Because God's the one who established the government, right? But there's also more that submitting to God, submitting to the authorities pleases God because that's what he commanded because that by doing right, you will silence the ignorance of foolish men. Okay, now this is kind of verse 12 again of last week, which was where he talks about that the, the ignorant men, the Gentiles, when you do right, will glorify God in the day of visitation, the day of judgment, God will be glorified because you did what was right, and they didn't. So when you rebel, our actions are to reflect positively on Christ and on the Lord. Um... In shutting the mouths of the foolish men. Now, now it's interesting. The, the word silence is kind of the word we use for muzzle. That's what you're going to do. You're going to shut their mouths. Okay? And who is it? It's foolish men. Who are they? Uh, they're the ones who don't receive the gospel in ignorance. Now, the ignorance here that he's using this word comes from it's not ignorant like you don't know. And I'll use the example. I mentioned the cell phones. You go back a century, a century and a half, or maybe even a half a century, and if you, if you handed somebody your, your cell phone, what, smartphone, and you said, how does it work? They'd be ignorant. They wouldn't understand. They couldn't comprehend. They couldn't grasp it. You'd have to explain it. This is more of an ignorance of knowing but refusing, knowing but rejecting. In other words, the ignorance of foolish men is hearing the gospel. They know it now. They've heard it. And then they reject it. They don't want it. So what do they want? Just like the leaders. You're going to put this guy's blood on us. Well, yeah, you're the ones that put him up on the cross. Yeah, but we don't want that. That's the ignorance he's talking about. Shutting their mouths. Remember, John 15, 25, it said that they hated me, Jesus, without a cause. Those are the ignorance men. They hate him without a cause. There's no basis for hating Jesus, but they hate him. Yeah. By submitting to authority, you shut their mouths. <laughs> Why? 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Right? Think about it. Pharaoh, the Jewish leaders at the time of Christ, Saul before his conversion. Right? They all fit into that group. They oppose Christ without a cause. They had no basis for it. But other than they hated him. And they're under the influence of Satan. Okay? Now, God says... Um, he would have your good conduct disarm the enemy's attack on Christ and his church. Submitting to authority diffuses the allegations of the enemy, making them harder to stick. That doesn't mean that they won't attack. That doesn't mean they won't ascribe to you evil when you haven't done evil. The early church was, was uh, accused of being cannibals because of a communion. Okay? It doesn't mean that the, the, the enemy won't lie about you. But what he's saying is you submit to authority. So that when you submit into authority, the, the evidence isn't there of doing malicious acts towards the authority. It's going to have to be for some other reason they, 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 they go after you. Okay? Uh, if you're persecuted, if you're going to be persecuted, don't let it be for disobeying authority. Let it be like for what Paul was persecuted for, for preaching Christ. Amen. Okay? If you look at the end of Acts, Paul's defense before the Roman rulers, they leveled a lot of charges at him. None of them could stick. They, they each of the governors said, you know, if, if this guy didn't appeal to Caesar, I'm letting him go. What was his charge? He told you, he goes, I am only here because of one thing, 
I preach the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2, I preach Christ and Him crucified. So if you're going to jail by civil authority, be it for preaching Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Okay? That's what Paul, Peter's on about. Pick your battles, as it were. If the government comes out and says you can't talk about Christ, it will be what it is. Because I'm not going to stop talking about it. In 1 Peter 2.16, he says, Act as free men and don't use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bondservant of God. Now again, I said, think back last week, same, same message in um, 9 through 12. Don't use it as a basis for lust. He reminds us that in addition to submitting authority, we don't take these instructions from the authorities to sin. Okay? What's this? Oh, the government comes along and says, now you, you sin. You don't partake of that, right? Because the instructions are you don't do that. You know that, that commandment, thou shall not murder? It's not kill, it's murder. Right? So can you, in good conscience, be a Christian who participates in that? No. And so if the government comes along and says, you know what, we're putting all these people over in these camps and we're going to kill them, you can't sit there idly by. You know what I'm talking about in history. You see the picture? They can't come along and say, you know what? Not only is it okay to, permissible for this to happen, but now you are to be a participant in it. Don't use this as a cloak. You can't sit there and say, well, you know, the government said I had to do this. No, you don't sin. You don't sin just because of that. Paul answered this in, in Romans 6. You know, are we going to sin that, that grace may abound? You know, no, you can't. You can't let sin be a master of it. You can't look at it and say, well, you know, this is kind of how it works. Where do you see that in today's world? In the business world, right? Well, you know, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and this is how business is done. We lie, we steal, we cheat, right? It's okay. Is it? No, no. no, it's not. That's what he's saying. You don't look at it and say, well, you know, that's the way it works. Honesty is honesty. Integrity is integrity. Don't let them color it just because that's what they want to do. So they want their objectives. To, they want to do what they want. Now remember that later on in chapter 4, Peter reminds the, the readers, his readers, we're going to get to this, that the people you're worried about, the sinners who are seeming to get away with it, who are in charge and abusing their authority, he says, they will answer to God. See, it's not your job or my job to make them. Right? Our job is to submit and let God take care of it. And oh, by the way, guess what? You too, as a believer, someday will stand before that seat of God. You will. And there you're going to answer, did you submit to authority? But the, the, the assurance in 1 Peter 4, 5 is they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They will give an account. They will have to answer for their actions. As will we. See how he keeps us moving in that direction? If I'm going to have to answer for this, what should I be doing? Submit to all authorities, whether the king or his governor, right? Now in verse uh, 17, he says, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. This is summarizing the, the Lord's desire for the heart of the believer with respect to people. Believers, God, and, and the king, those in authority. We're to honor and respect all people, all persons, with no exception. There's no place for dishonor or disrespect of another person. Why? They're all made in the image of God. Now that does not mean <laughs> we're going to agree with them, like them, respect what they do, how they go about doing it. Okay? But in dealing with them, I go back to John and, and Peter with the, the council. When they addressed him, they addressed him with respect and honor. Respect his people, honor to the position. Okay? Why? Because they put themselves in the hands of God, as Christ did, knowing that he's the one that's going to judge righteously. Okay? You know, in, in 1 Peter 1.22 and in 4.8, he says the same thing with respect to the brotherhood, the believers. We're to have a fervent love for the brethren, one for another from the heart. He's just repeating himself. Especially with the body of believers, there's a submission, there's a forgiveness, there's a grace that we extend. They're slow to anger, quick to forgive. That's the picture. 
And he wants us to kind of say, you know, if I'm treating you this way, should I be treating them that any other way? No, you shouldn't. If, if, you're, if I'm saying, you know, I can, I can extend grace. And I just had this conversation yesterday with somebody about an issue of work. And I said, I can extend grace because people extend grace to me. But if I can extend grace here, what about the people over here doing things I don't like, saying things I don't like, making me do things I don't like because it's the law? Can I extend grace? I hope so because somebody extended an awful lot of grace to me to save me. Um, who was it that asked Jesus if he had to forgive his brother seven times? Oh yeah, it was Peter. Right? And Jesus corrected him. Seven times 70. The picture is just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Don't let it end. As long as we're doing that, we're going to respect people. We're going to honor people. We have to find the grace from God to forgive, but we need to be doing that. And the third thing, Peter says that we're to honor God. You find it interesting? He says, honor God before he says, um, honor or uh, he says fear God before he says honor the king I think that's purposeful he's making that connection again if you're going to fear God how are you going to respond to the king you're going to honor him why because God already told you honor the king respect the king so you see the picture it, it's purposeful it's to remind us that the king is under the Lord who does the king answer to? Now, let me just tell you this. Or the president, he does not answer to me. Okay? He doesn't answer to me. I have my opinions, and if he wants them, I will gladly give them to him. But he does not answer to me. He answers to God. Just some note for you to take Jude 4 and 8, because there's only one chapter. In both those chapters, Jude says, it is the ungodly who reject authority. See, because it, it, it grows. They may start out rejecting here, but Jude's talking about it's up here. They've gotten to the point where they've rejected God in everything in their life. So that's the ungodly. They start here rejecting authority, making themselves to be God, and it goes there. Now, when you see the ungodly in authority, it's difficult, honestly, to say at the least, to honor and submit. Because why? It goes against our, our, our nature. Go, we see them and we say that's just so wrong. Well, Christ is our example, and that's spelled out, you know, in Titus three, because Titus Paul repeats what he's already said. He's uh, in, in Romans thirteen, but remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasure, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. See, Titus' instruction, Paul's instructions to Titus, Submit to the authority because you've got to remember, if, especially if they're lost, they're lost. And you were too. And he just nailed it down. You're complaining because they're all this. And he says, well, what was your life before Christ? You were in the same box. You are doing the same thing. Well, here he transitions from civil authority to more of a social or domestic authority in verse 18. In our, in our world today, in our environment, this could be the work environment. It applies to home and to the church as well. Submission is universal. You look your scriptures, you'll see it for the house, you'll see it for the home, you see it for the church. Verse 18, servants, be submissive to your master with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also those who are unreasonable. Now, Peter's going to cover some of the same ground, so I'm not going to take 40 minutes. On, the, on this, okay? It's the same ground he just covered with civil authorities, pretty much. The idea of submission is not an issue of deserving. Okay, get that clear. Submission has nothing to do with they deserve it. And I've heard this before. I heard this, I heard this spewed from the television, and, and the issue is they don't deserve it. Well, that's not the issue of submission, right? I don't want to name names, but there was a, a young man that was told to sit in a chair at the detention center, and he wouldn't sit, and he fought the, 
the detention officer. He ended up dead. Okay, that's a whole other story, but the fact was, what did that get him by asserting his right that I don't have to do what you tell me? Got him dead. If the guy was wrong, he had, the day would have come when he might have been vindicated, but he's dead. All right? I remember many, many, many years ago, and I told my kids this because I heard it from my dad, um, and, and it was, it, there was a time when we had respect for the authority, and I said that the, the most clearest example we have of civil authority is police. And here's the deal. When the police tell you to stop, you want to know what you should probably do? Stop. Stop, because it ends there, pretty much. Who doesn't stop? Usually, the guilty, right? Now, establishing I submission is, is not a deserving. It's an issue of obedience to God in His glory. So, as with civil authority, uh, Christianity does not afford the right nor the privilege to rebel against the, so the authority of the social structure. In, Col in Ephesians, uh, Paul tells slaves to be obedient to your masters as to Christ, knowing that from Him you'll receive back from the Lord. He says pretty much the same thing in Colossians. Slaves, in all things obey your masters, fearing the Lord. See, the obedience is related to your relationship to God, not whether they deserve it. Uh, do your work heartily as for the Lord, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward. You serve the Lord. Peter says the attitude and demeanor of the master is irrelevant to our response. We're to submit. Unlike the slaves at the time of Peter, though, however, we have a different world today. You actually can choose to remove yourself from a bad master-slave situation, right? You don't like your boss, what can you do? Quit, right? However, point this out, just as Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, before the council, do it with respect and do it with honor. Why? Because if you walk out in a huff, ask yourself, am I honoring God or taking care of my little pride? Okay, there's a guy who went to Bible study. Larry Wright was his name. He did Bible studies. He'd been a disc jockey in town. He was a very well known um, in the day. And he told the story about how he became a Christian. And as he became a Christian, he realized he couldn't stay in this industry because he was really getting called into the ministry. And he told the story about, he went to the producer, his boss, and said, I'm out of here. And he goes, you can't go. This is ratings week, and it will kill me. And I'll never, Larry's joke was, that's the way the Mercedes Benz just happens. He said he got down to the floor and got out on Central Avenue, and the Holy Spirit said, uh-uh. He just talked about it. He said, went back up and said, no, I, the Holy Spirit, I, I, I'll stay through ratings. And the, and the producer said, Wow, he goes, I was thinking that that wasn't the Larry I'd, know, I'd become to know who had just changed. He said it was five or six years later, he gets a call in the middle of the night from a guy, his producer. Says, I'm down here wherever in some little hotel. My wife kicked me out. I've been running around. Can I talk to you? And he led the man to Christ. And he told the story, if I just walked out like I felt I was supposed to be in the ministry, probably wouldn't have gotten that call. Submission only goes, uh, again, to the point of violating God's law. That includes your boss. Um, we're to submit to that point. I, I get a quick story. Sarah called me. She's a teacher, fifth grade, in local school. And there's a lot going on as far as the liberal agenda that you see in the world about identity for fifth and sixth and fourth graders. So there was an incident between two kids because you didn't call me what I wanted to be called. And that, that the, and she was being told, you have to do this. And Sarah, she called me because she'd already made her mind up. I am not going to do that because it's contrary to what God says. And we had a long discussion, and I was reassuring her. I believe she was right. I said, here's what you do. You stand, and this is where we're at. You stand for what God has called is right, and you accept the consequences. I told her, I said, don't worry about it, honey. If you stand for what's right, and it is right, and you get fired... Don't worry about it, because God will take care of you. Amen. And that is the truth when it comes to submission. Do what is right, knowing that God is able to deliver you. We're going to finish quickly here, verses 19 and 20. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? 
But if when you do what is right and suffer for it patiently, endure it, it finds favor with God. God. He's saying if you suffer willingly at the hands of the unreasonable, it finds favor with God. God sees it. He's pleased. He notes it. Because you're trusting in Him to fix or rectify. You're not taking it to yourself. God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And that's what He wants you to do is hand it to Him. Um, now, in verse 20, he warns about that if we sin against our supervisor, goes back to the sword, you can expect to suffer the consequences too. He says, if you sin, don't, don't act like it's a great thing to suffer the uh, getting, you know, maybe fired. You know, if you're lazy, a busybody, you come in late, you go home early to make up for it, okay? You don't do your job or you do it poorly, you may get fired. And don't tell me you're being persecuted for your faith. You're getting fired because you're lazy, right? Verse 20, he bookends verse um, uh, 19 where he says, taking it patiently, right? Suffering from the unjust, being mistreated, overlooked, maligned, marginalized, finds favor with God. Okay? We don't like that. I get it. But he says, you do it, and it finds favor with God. What does submission do? It teaches you some very important life lessons Submission will teach you humility, grace, and forgiveness while displacing your fleshly reactions of anger, vengeance, hostility, discontent, rebellion, and pride. I'm going to close and give you the, uh, I like that Ernie always said, the end of sermon with the so what. As we end it, so what? Well, one is you're going to learn some things. You're going to shed your, your human nature, some character traits that Christians don't want to have, and pick up some ones that God says, I want you to have. Um, again, verses 11 and 12, you're a pilgrim. Remember that. But that doesn't mean you're not part of the society, because 13 through 17, you are part of society. And you're expected to live accordingly. This is under God's authority. To rebel is to rebel against God. And in, in 18, in, uh, verse 15 says, obedience is the will of God. Do you want to know the will of God? He says in verse 15 of chapter 1, 1 Peter 2, obey. That's the will of God. 18 and 20, uh, we're identified as servants. And as such, we're to submit to those over us. The good, the bad, and the ugly. If I was at all skilled, I would have had uh, Nathan play the music there from that show. That would have been perfect, but we're not... Although we see ourselves in three roles uh, submitting to man, we're actually in all three roles submitting to God. All three roles. Um, what about the rulers? They're despots. Yep, they are. What about supervisors? They're unqualified, arrogant, unreasonable, and vindictive. Yeah, they might be. No exceptions there. How we're told to respond to every one of them is submit. And why? It's for the Lord's sakes. You're trying to please, are you trying to please men or please God? Something to remember, two things to remember here as you, as you look at this and say how come and why. Two things to care, critical. First off, Ephesians 6, 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers and powers, against the worldly forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies. See, when we see people and we project to them our displeasure, right, remembering that they're blinded by Satan, the Bible says your actual warfare is not with them. It's the power behind it. The whole book of Exodus and with Pharaoh, right, was God was going at the, the, the gods of Egypt because he was going to the power behind it. It was just Pharaoh would not would refuse to bend, right? But when you see it, understand that that's your dilemma. That's who you're fighting against. The tyranny in government and in society is from him. He's influencing. He's directing. Because he wants to thwart the work of God and destroy the objects of God's love, which is people. Okay? Two, this is important, and this is where we close. God has given you the means of defeating the enemy and making the change you want. First, and he's covered it in all three sections. In every section, he laid out that as a believer, your defensive weapon against the tyranny of the world is obedience. Don't submit to lusts. Obey the laws. And every one of those, submit to your supervisor, your master. That's your defensive mechanism. How do you defend yourself against it? Do what's right. 
Because if you're doing what's right, the only charge they can bring against you is 1 Corinthians 2. I preach Christ and Him crucified. And if you're persecuted for that, bless God. You've got a great life. Secondly, we do have an offensive weapon. It's a twofold offensive weapon God has given you to fight the tyranny of society, of the work, right? First is the Word of God. 617 of Ephesians, take up what? The Word of God, the, the, spirit, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And secondly is prayer. I'm going to quote a guy I've listened to for years who's passed, Chuck Smith with Calvary Chapel. And he made a point, and I thought it was a very poignant point. If, for all the civil disobedience the Christians expended against the abortion issue, if we had spent half that time, half that energy in prayer, abortion would have ended 20 years ago. See, the problem was, we took up the signs and the protests of the ungodly of the 60s and thought we could make it the tool of God. God will not stand for it. Because we're not going to revel in His glory. We're not going to take credit for it. It's not because we protested. It's not because we blew up an abortion clinic or whatever the bad people out there are doing. It's because we saw that we couldn't do it. We got on our knees. We got on our faces. And we put it to God to do what only He can do, to do what we cannot do, so that we can't get in the way and take the credit, but give God the credit and give God the glory. Amen? Amen. Now, one thing to remember, and there's all this submission is really important, is in 2 Peter 1, 4, He said, don't worry about the evil people. They will stand before God. And as we end today, that is something we always have to repeat for everybody. If you are not a believer, you will stand before the God of this universe, the creator of this universe, as a judge. Let me open the back of the book and give you some, uh, I'll cheat and tell you the end of the book. If you find yourself standing there, you've lost. You're lost now, you just don't know it. But you will find out there that day that there's no hope and there's no reprieval at that point. The only hope, the only reprieval you have in this life is here today. If you hear His voice and you answer His call, you will be saved. And as we, as we uh, sing our song of invitation, we ask that you, you'll, you come forward and uh, one of the elders will pray with you. If you have other issues you, want to pray, you need prayer for, the elders will be here. Let's pray.